What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Guys, we have another animal training episode today, which I'm very excited for because these are some of my favorite animals. Basically, probably second favorite after octopuses. You have gone off about elephants a lot lately. Oh, I just spoiled it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Masters of our craft wheel. <laughs> so yeah, uh, spoilers aside, our question today is, what if you could perfectly train elephants? One of the coolest animals. not And not just because they're big. They do lots of other stuff too, which we will get into. And since I'm the host, I get to decide who goes first. I'm going to pick myself because forget both of you guys. So... When I was looking at training elephants, the first thing I wanted to look at was actually what, you know, we train elephants already. People already train elephants for things. So I was looking at what we do and the interesting stuff. And so, of course, I ended up looking at uh, the Ringling Circus and, you know, all their elephant acts, which they no longer do because the way they trained elephants was cruel and inhuman and very sad. But we can do it in a fun hypothetical way that doesn't make the elephant sad. And so... The most interesting thing that I found for their act was in the early 1900, Barlin Bailey's, who run the Ringling Circus, uh, their chief elephant trainer, decided to teach his charges how to play ball. I, I, sorry, I was kind of I just copy and pasted that off the internet. <laughs> Teaches his charges, I guess is what you call your elephants. Teaches <laughs> his charges. I don't know. Is it a group of elephants called a charge or just that's just their fun language? Anyway, but he wanted to teach them how to play baseball. Uh, He taught an elephant named Pilot to swing a bat, and another named Bessie to use a mitt, and after two years of effort, he taught another elephant, Coco, to pitch. Uh, And in 1912, they played their very first game, and the act was so popular that they actually ended up creating their own full elephant baseball team with nine players. It says other circuses later followed suit. I couldn't find a lot of information because this was the early 1900s, so I don't know if they had inter-circus elephant baseball games but i don't think so i think they would just have their elephants do different things one of the fun facts was actually they also in addition to you know actually being able to play with the with the bat and the ball they would teach the elephants to slide into first base which is just hilarious to me (laughs) so the thing is since we're perfectly trained these elephants you know we we can get a little further than spending two years teaching one elephant on a pitch we can get them a little bit more skilled and so i kind of wanted to look at how good elephants were would be at baseball so the first thing is how hard can they, you know, how hard can they throw it? How hard can they hit it? So an elephant trunk can lift 700 pounds. <laughs> or as one source I saw said, 700,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> Which is why you double de- double checked your facts on the internet. I-, I like the idea that if that were true, an elephant would be able to just like put his trunk on the ground and like do seven flips in the air before laying or something <laughs> that pushed off. <laughs> like. <just> <laughs> I, I did look up other things. I tried to look up what 700,000 pounds was just to put it in context. And so uh, a couple of points on that was it's the weight of two like single story homes or the weight of three blue whales. So just imagine <laughs> like three blue whales stacked on top of each other. An elephant just comes by and just like, whoop. All right. <laughs> but it actually is 700 pounds. And thanks to the wonderful website, The Measure of Things, I can tell you that's just to put it in context, is about one and two-fifths times as heavy as a cubic meter of snow. So now you have a great idea of what 700 pounds <laughs> is like. <laughs> as far as running the bases, an elephant can run up to 25 miles an hour. Though, interestingly, there's a debate about whether they elephants can run or not. <laughs> Wait, how? I am trying to imagine an elephant running, and it does look weird in my head. I've seen elephants run. I guess it's, it's like a trot, I guess. So... Elephants can definitely speed up and have a max speed. 25 miles an hour is pretty fast. Yeah. The thing is, their quote-unquote running motion isn't different than their walking motion. (laughs) 
and their feet, you know, not their feet never all leave the ground like, you know, um, basically every other MMO when it's running. And basically the only criteria you have to fill to be, to have it count as running is that your gait is different than your walking, and it isn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> theoretically, elephants only speed walk at 25 miles an hour. And so they can, you know, they would be strong. They can run fairly fast. Actually, not ridiculously fast. I mean, Usain Bolt, is, you know, his top speed was 23, which is the fastest human. But it's kind of on similar orders of magnitude compared to what the stuff we usually look at. And then could, like, they throw the ball kind of, you know, accurately enough to hit it. So I couldn't find any videos of the Ringling Circus because it was in 1912. But I did find a video from a minor league baseball team that brought an elephant out to throw the first pitch. And after one absolutely wild pitch that went, like, eight feet over his head, the elephant threw basically a perfect strike. So that puts him on par with major league pitchers, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is, this is the part where I usually start to scale things up, but finding out how fast an elephant can throw a ball is actually incredibly complicated. We, we've talked about throwing speeds before on this show, and it involves a lot of, it's not just like strength-based, it's like dexterity and, you know, arm composition. The arc. Based. Yeah, arc based with like angular momentum and different things limiting the, uh, the, the speed of the ball is limited by different factors and strength. I also couldn't find, even if I found out how fast I threw the ball, I, wouldn't, I couldn't find good reaction times for elephants, because assuming the ball would be faster, because their trunk is much more flexible than an arm and much stronger, so it would be able to throw the ball faster, I would doubt the elephant would be able to hit the ball. Uh, and if they could hit the ball, I, wouldn't re- I couldn't really figure out how hard they'd be able to hit it, because again, I would have the same angular momentum problems. You'd be, you had a video of it, though, and you could have like timed how long it took for it to get from the pitcher's man to the to home plate. You could well, the, the, it was a pretty casual toss from oh. that elephant. Oh, uh, okay. Like, if you're going to train these elephants perfectly, you're going to teach these elephant how to, like, you know, throw, like, a, a I don't know, a two-seam fastball or, like, a one-nostril fastball, I guess. <laughs> I guess the seams were on the ball, so you could still call it a two-seam fastball. But anyway, basically, I, I realized I was, I, as I was, comp- like, you know, tackling these problems, I realized I was looking at the wrong sport anyway. Because while I was scouring the web for basically any video of an elephant playing baseball... I had also found a video by Rene Cassily in Hungary where he taught his elephants several basketball tricks. And so his video was much more helpful. So he's got, he's got you know, he has a scene where the, ba- the elephant just kind of like goes over, dunks the basketball, scores the basket. The one that was the most encouraging, I think, was that, you know, it was a video, he was going to take a shot and the elephant just like puts his foot up and blocks him and just shuts him down with his foot. And then the last one was the elephant tossed a, like a layup and the second elephant launched him into the air for him to slam dunk it. So I'm like, that's awesome. So definitely elephants have enough skills to play basketball. Like they have the dexterity, they can throw the ball, they can understand to get it in the hoop. And there's really only one thing that hinders an elephant from exploring the most exciting moments in baseball. And that's the fact that elephants can't jump. This is actually a true fact. Because, you know, it's, it's like one of those animal facts, right? You hear it all the time. And I'm like, I'm not sure if that's actually true or not. Or if they just don't very often jump. And it just sticks in people's mind because they're heavy. But no, elephants physically cannot jump. Um, the most common answer is that they're just not strong. En- their legs just aren't strong enough to lift their mass. I'm a little suspicious of this one. It's like half the reason that no one's seen an elephant jump is because they don't need to. And they would never bother to. Because elephants can go back up on their hind legs in balance. So... I feel like you're not too far away from, like, at least jumping a tiny bit from there, like, strength-wise. I like the idea that, that all the elephants are like, oh, no, we totally can jump. We just don't want you to see us. Like, we can jump really high, guys. Like, <laughs> But, like, really why high. would an elephant ever need to jump? No, I know. They wouldn't. <laughs> and so this, this, prob- this, this problem can easily be rectified with the generous application of trampolines or some equally wacky method. Um, but there is actually another problem with why they don't jump. And it's that their feet aren't built for it. So actually, all the bones in an elephant's leg point downward, which sounds like it makes sense. Like, that's you how you imagine legs are. Like, you know, our leg bones point downwards. But the thing is, it's actually the foot is where it really differs from us. So the way an elephant's foot is built, imagine, like, take your, like, put your hand out, like, extend your fingers, and now have your fingertips touch without, like, curling them up. And then basically put that down on the table. That's basically what an elephant's foot bone looks like. All the fingers, well, their toes, all the toes pointed straight down. So it's like landing a jump from like on a tippy toe stance. 
Yeah, so the problem is their bone structure is too narrow, and if you put too much pressure on there, it's going to, like, I mean, in my head, it just pierces through and is very bad. It's, let's just say the force of landing would be unkind to the elephant. So there's two options we have here. I think both of which create equally awesome and different sports. First thing is to not abandon the trampolines and simply fix the foot problem. So if you can give the elephant shock absorbing shoes that absorb the impact so it's not damaging to its feet, then they might be able to jump safely. Effectively, just create them an industrial pair of Air Jordans. <laughs> and then I think they could just, you know, it'd be pretty good too. Because if they have, you know, if they need more air, they can just use their trunks to inflate it. So you just then put, add elephants in a trampoline floor and you're good to go. You can have bouncy elephant baseball, uh, basketball. The second thing is just to forget about the jumping and bring people back to do the jumping for them. So I mentioned before that an elephant's trunk can lift 700 pounds. This is more than enough to lift a person. So the sport then becomes a series of players balancing on elephant trunks and playing basketball effectively, like, higher, you know, like, like at a mid-air level playing basketball. And then you make the hoops, of course, like, now the hoops are going to be, like, 30 feet up as opposed to, like, I don't know how high they are regulation-wise, but less than 30. Of course, this is incredibly dangerous for all the people. I was going to (laughs) say. So what you're going to do now is now you make it a pool sport so that the, you know, the basketball players can do all the cool tricks and flips and jumps and all the awesome things that they want to do. They're going to need some, you know, some water to safely land in. So then the question is, how much water do you need for, um, and so I use the, uh, diving, you know, the regulation diving depths if you're diving off a diving board. And so for a 15 foot diving board, which is the closest size regulation I have to how tall an elephant would, plus its trunk would be, the water needs to be 12 and a half feet deep. So conveniently, elephants are somewhere between eight foot three and 13 feet tall. So... If you have elephants in the water, the tallest elephants would be tall enough to play this sport. So it does size out shorter elephants, but basketball also sizes out short people. So I think that's fair. (laughs) And then, yeah, you just have a pool with like elephants with like, you know, mostly submerged, but they can rear out of the water if they want to. I think the elephants would be allowed to shoot, but then the most of it is just going to be them like tossing people and tossing basketballs around and trying to score on like this basket that's just like way above the way above the pool and i think it would be fracking awesome even with the pool i think it'd be a terrifying sport to play for the humans oh yeah no it's it would be a little scary but i think the fact that you get to play with elephants and in a pool and it's just the sheer little awesome would attract you know enough players to get the the game done i mean people play rugby and that's just as dangerous and way less (laughs) exciting because there's no elephants in it just as dangerous as maybe underselling things a little (laughs) bit but they don't play rugby in a pool softer landings but, uh, yeah, that's what I got. Either, you know, trampoline basketball with uh, Air Jordans or pool basketball with people flying around all over the place. Chris, what would you do with your elephant training? So when I was looking up elephant abilities and facts and stuff, I found a lot of stuff that I was like, oh, this would be good for a heist. And I figured I haven't done a heist in a while, so I'm going to do a heist. The traditional thing we do. Yes. Usually you do the heist, but this time me. So I'm just going to run through some of the traits that would be good for a heist first. So I found one ability that they can mimic sounds. So there's an elephant named Mwika. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I also don't know if it's a he or she. I think it's a she, but she could copy the sounds of a truck. And that's how they discovered this ability. And then there's some other elephants that can do other, like, I think, more impressive stuff. So Co- uh, an elephant named Kosik, which is an Indian elephant in South Korea, she can imitate five Korean words. So she can say sit, no, yes, and lie down in Korean. And the way that she does this is that she places her trunk in her mouth. I'm saying she, but again, I don't know if it's he or her, she. I'm not really sure. I'm just going to stick with she. (laughs) She sticks her trunk in her mouth and then she vibrates it while she breathes out. And that's how she mimics these words. I don't even understand. Like, 
I hear your words. I'm like, I don't know how that would make a, like a recognizable sound. So I think we actually talked about this once on the podcast before. I feel like I talked about this. Did we? I don't remember this. I don't remember. Why don't remember would we be talking it, about this? I don't remember when it was, but I definitely talked about talking animals. Oh, you did talk about talking animals. I remember that one. The yeah, question was, what if animals could that talk? Must, you guys must be pulling one from like, who yesteryear. Oh, I'm, I'm looking now. I'm trying to find it. I'm pretty sure the question is just, what if animals could talk? I think so. And you were like, they can talk. <laughs> yeah, I think that was basically how it went. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was an early episode. But uh, anyway, so basically, I just think this would be a good like distraction method or sneaky distraction. Like if, if they take out a guard and then the guard is like, are you okay over there? Then the elephant can just be like, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> they might sound a little different than, than the, the guard. But I mean, I think they can make it pass. I think they can get, get away with it. <laughs> So that's that's a method of distraction. Another method of distraction, elephants are known to just do things for entertainment, to like entertain themselves and also others. Uh, so some t- a lot of elephants are known to just suck up water and uh, with their trunks and then blow it out like a fountain. So that's like another perfect distraction. They don't even need to be part of the heist. Or like if the guards see an elephant outside... They just be like, oh, that's, that's a cool elephant that's doing cool stuff. Yeah, an elephant is, a, is enough of a distraction right. just by being an elephant. Yeah, but then he has a cool fountain thing. It's like, oh, someone like hired this elephant or something to entertain us. And it's a perfect distraction while the other elephants do their heisting. <laughs> I like the I like the idea that someone sees an elephant by themselves spraying water. I'm like, oh, someone must have hired that. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't do that for free. No, uh, must be security guard appreciation day. <laughs> yeah, someone got me an elephant. That should be a day. I mean, it probably is already. It probably is. Yeah, so that's distractions. There, I think they're pretty well equipped to distract the guards. So next, I looked at. Their ability to use tools. Apparently, they can use tools. In nature, they use branches to scratch their backs. And then in, like, captive an- captive elephants sometimes use boxes to, like, reach food that's out of their reach. Other elephants have been known to place, like, rocks on electric fences in order to pass through them without getting hurt. And then there are some elephants that can use paintbrushes. So there are a few elephants that paint. One of them is Ruby at the phoenix zoo and ruby phoenix oh <laughs> i mean that's not you're getting excited about phoenix because that's like your name kind of but it's not really your name <laughs> yeah it's like my 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 internet moniker is, is marcus phoenix so, yeah yeah i just shouted phoenix <laughs> at him literally just instant. but these paintings that ruby paints some of them have sold for up to twenty five thousand dollars so they're actually pretty valuable they're not just like random paint like smeared on a canvas there's another elephant in thailand that paints flowers so they can paint like actual objects that look like things and then there's a viral video that it went viral a while ago you might have seen it before but there's an elephant that paints another elephant i've seen it yeah which is very impressive and i think it was revealed later that it wasn't actually like a result of creativity they actually taught the elephant like a sequence of learned brush strokes so it's really just the elephant going through the motions but i think that's a that's a way to minimize art like oh man (laughs) well i mean if they just teach it to i I get i get what you're saying like it's not like the elephant was able to envision an elephant and draw an elephant on it it was not a self-portrait right like right but I, I can't, like, if I did a good drawing that I based off something else, and someone said, uh, you just learn how to do a bunch of brush strokes and apply them. I'd be like, well, screw you. No, I drew this. <laughs> this yeah, but it's art. more like if someone's like, okay, take your hand and put it here and then move it in this angle for this distance. <laughs> yeah, it's called learning how to draw. <laughs> anyway, but the fact that it, it was taught, I think, just proves more that elephants can learn precise movements from like me training it so i can teach it to learn how to use the lock pick and stuff and it will be able to do it that's really my main application of its tool use i'm probably gonna have it use lock picks i don't know exactly how it might be a little difficult because lock picks are small and i don't know maybe i attach it to a stick or something and it can hold the stick an elephant's trunk is dexterous enough to pick up a single grain of rice 
Okay. Then as they can do it. As long as can grab 80 other grenades at the same time. No, I'm kidding. It's actually pretty dangerous. <laughs> and it's also because I think lock picks require you actually have to use two different pieces that are separate from each other at the same time. But I feel like I'd be able to teach the elephant how to do that. So I'm going to say you can do it. I, As with most times we've said that animals can pick locks, I have doubts about this, but I'm going to let it go. <laughs> 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 have we ever agreed that an animal can pick a lock? No. <laughs> at least I have not. I'm sure like a, a monkey could do it. Okay, it probably can. We haven't done if you could train monkeys yet, though. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. But they can, elephants can also manipulate like uh, other complex mechanisms. For example, um, there's an Asian elephant named Bandula in California who was able to unlock her shackles. It had a bunch of different components to it, but the most complex component to it was the Brommel hook, which is two hooks that are attached to each other. And then in order to unhook them, you have to like align this little gap on both of them to get them apart and she was able to do it and she actually do know that this one was a she ha (laughs) (laughs) redeemed (laughs) and um after she freed herself she actually went and helped other elephants escape as well which i think is pretty cool that is pretty cool and while they were escaping they actually exhibited signs of like deception where they were like looking around to see if other people if humans were around to see them and they're like making sure that they weren't being seen so this just kind of demonstrates that they understand the basic idea of stealth which is obviously stealth is very useful for a heist so it's not something that yet you necessarily have to teach them they already know it so we have distractions we have tools and we have stealth next we have um Communication. They can, so elephants can communicate with very low frequency calls that are actually below, the the frequencies are below what humans can hear. So they can communicate up to two kilometers. So it's very long distance and it's silent to us. And the way they do this is that um, they do it seismically. So they can detect vibrations in the ground using their feet and their trunk. And Obviously, this is going to be very, very useful for a heist if they can communicate with each other without anyone hearing it. So those are really the basic skills that they have for a heist. But you may have already thought that elephants are big. So how are they going to fit in whatever they're heisting? Like they can't really, they can't fit through any doorways. So like banks and museums really aren't going to work. So I need something big. I need something that has big openings for their entrances and i started looking at warehouses specifically amazon warehouses so obviously amazon warehouses are big and they have those big openings for the trucks so they can load the trucks and they have a lot of valuable stuff in them too because they sell a lot of stuff and i wanted to see what kind of stuff our elephants could steal because we don't want to just get all the really cheap stuff because you're gonna have to make like 100 trips it's not going to be very efficient So I started looking at the most expensive things you can get on Amazon just to get the value density as efficient as possible. Now, when I was doing this, I went on Amazon and they have this thing where you can sort by price, but they couldn't, you can't do it if you're browsing through every single item, every single item. You have to like pick a category. So I started with jewelry. That seemed like a good place to start. How much damage have you done to your Amazon <laughs> search like preferences right now? I don't know because I haven't. It hasn't been long enough for me to see the damages. I like. Oh, I, I, I literally avoid clicking any Amazon links from anything. I'm just <laughs> like, I don't want to have ads for it for the next four weeks. Well, now they're gonna start thinking I'm rich. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the most expensive piece of jewelry that I found on Amazon, uh, just by sorting the price. It was um, a necklace. So it's the official name, I guess, is extra large forty one point thirty one T white and fancy yellow diamond eighteen carat two tone gold flower necklace. I don't know why they call it fancy yellow, but <laughs> it's white and fancy yellow diamond, <laughs> and it's sold by Mon- Milano Jewelers, and its price is two hundred sixty five thousand seven hundred eighty one dollars and twenty five cents. Does it come with like free delivery? It is. It does have free shipping. All right. As long as it's Amazon Prime eligible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's Amazon Prime, but it said free shipping. I didn't see the Prime logo on it. 
Oh, then you shouldn't buy it. That's a waste. <laughs> Who knows if it'll even get there? Yeah, I know. I don't know if I can trust Milano Jewelers. So on the front page of the jewelry website, they also had a bunch of other jewelry, and those are all also expensive. So they had 20 other pieces of jewelry that were over $100,000. So, And I assume all of them, like, usually if they're low on stock, then they indicate that. So I don't think they're low on stock. They probably have multiple of these in stock. So that's a pretty good thing to steal, I guess. I wasn't actually... actually I wasn't exactly sure how Amazon sellers works if uh, Milano Jewelers has to store them in the warehouses or if they can just sell them from their store. I wasn't sure, but I'm going to assume that they're in the warehouse. And if not, I'm like, I think probably at least one of them is going to be in the warehouse. I wouldn't know. You're the only, you're the only one who's ever sold anything through Amazon. So that is a book, though. So <laughs> it's not Books, it's not jewelry. a $200,000 necklace. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> you should have made that instead. I should have. Then I would know for this answer. I would be able to give you a definitive answer. But I can't. Also, you might have 200000 more dollars. Well, I don't know if people actually sell this stuff. There were a couple of these had reviews on them, and they're clearly joke reviews. <laughs> I like the idea that someone would spend $250,000 or whatever on a diamond, you know, some diamond jewelry on Amazon. That just seems hysterical to me that you'd like. Yeah. That would be the way you'd, you know, go about this purchase. Yeah. Anyone want to add something to the cart before I check out? I just put a couple necklaces in here. I mean, you know how it is when, like, you're trying to get to the free sh- shipping threshold and you just need a little something to, you know, tip it over the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need, to get, I need to get free shipping on this boat, so I need to put 200000 more dollars in my cart. Right. <laughs> so that's jewelry. Next, I looked at arts and collectibles because I figure there's a lot of like fine art out there and collectibles can get pretty pricey too or valuable. And this is actually where I found the most expensive thing when I was looking. I don't know if there's more expensive stuff, but this was the highest one I saw. So it was, ju- it was a poster of The Bride of Frankenstein. I guess it's a collectible. It was really like the, it was just a normal poster. And the it was sold by Poster City, and it cost nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Holy wow! But yeah, almost a million dollars. So what is this post? Like, what is the? So the official name is the Bride of Frankenstein, nineteen thirty five Karloff teaser one sheet Universal Horror exclamation point. But yeah, it's really. I mean, I'm clicking the link right now, and I'm looking at the picture. It looks like it's just a poster. Oh, it's currently unavailable. It was available when I when I found it. So someone bought it, I <laughs> oh, guess. <laughs> someone must have bought it for for a million dollars on Amazon. And it has a one star rating now. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's the poster that apparently is not available anymore, but it was when I found it and it was super expensive. Those are really the two categories that I thought I'd find the most expensive stuff um, in jewelry and arts and collectibles. Uh, but then I found, like, for some reason, I found myself browsing the office electronics. <laughs> I just found my way there somehow. And it wasn't the most expensive single item. The poster was the most expensive single item. But I did find in the office electronics a paper shredder that was $319,267.23. What? Is that like a paper shredder? shredder maybe (laughs) like (laughs) i don't know if it might be like an industrial paper shredder at that price it would have to be there are no like dimensions on the product page or anything but it i guess so they call it a continuous duty strip cut shredder with 24 sheet capacity i don't know what that means but i mean apparently it's heavy duty it can shred like cds and stuff and it has like a sensor that automatically stops if you put your fingers close to it so it does have some fancy stuff (laughs) does not sound worth it worth three hundred thousand dollars do you know what else you could buy for three hundred thousand dollars a regular paper shredder a piece of paper that says don't put your fingers near this and you know two hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars of whatever else you want and they do have 10 of these in stock as at least when i first looked up they had 10 in stock actually i have the link they still have tenant stock. No one bought these. Surprise! Unless they restock. Maybe they sold all ten and got ten new ones in. Oh, the price went up. The price is higher now than what I saw it before. 
Demand is high. <laughs> and that was 328000 Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so those are just some expensive things. Oh, yeah, they had tenant stock. So if you steal all 10 of them, then that's over $3 million. So that's a pretty good haul. So those are probably the three things I'd focus on is the jewelry, the pi- the poster, and the paper shredders. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the, sh- the shredders are pretty convenient, too, because they probably weigh, le- weigh less than the 700,000 pounds that elephants are able to lift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if I could train elephants, then I would train them to break into those um, those Amazon warehouses. I don't actually know what the shifts are like there, because I think they have a lot of actual people working there, like, probably throughout the day. But we have distractions. We can distract them, so we're good <laughs> with our um, elephant fountain technique. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, Ben, what do you do? So I'm realizing right now that I don't actually have a good way to explain why I did what I did yet. So I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> This is why we put you last. Let's just jump for the chase here. I wanted to put an elephant on a boat. There's reasons for this that we'll get to later. But before we can get to like the various use cases of an elephant on a boat, we have to figure out, can we put an elephant on a boat? Because elephants are very heavy, and boats obviously have, you know, limited capacity. We've put heavy things on boats before. (laughs) I'm going to say, like, the answer's not no. (laughs) Yeah, we have, like, cargo ships. Like, well, yeah, like, obviously you can put an elephant on a cargo ship, but, like, (laughs) an elephant, like... I, I want this more for personal use, you know? I want an elephant friend as, like, my, my, like, first mate, you know? Okay. So, it was actually not trivial to find just, like, a, you know, smallish boat. Like, not, you know, cargo ship sized that can carry an elephant. Because elephants, as you may, you know, probably know, are pretty heavy. It varies based on the species from, like, 6,000 to 13,000 pounds for an adult male elephant. And sort of the rough guideline for the carrying capacity of a boat is, like, the length times the width in feet divided by 15 is the number of people you can have. And apparently, like, the accepted weight of a person is 185 pounds. The idea being that it's, like, person and, you know, some stuff. So, like, a relatively standard-sized, like, sailboat that, like, a person would have is something like 32 feet long and 10 and a half feet wide or so. And that only gives you about 4,100 pounds, which is not enough to carry an elephant. So I looked into a few options. I looked at like some yachts and stuff, but I decided that taking an elephant on a super yacht is probably not the most practical option, although it's pretty baller. We can all agree. Yeah, I'm going to say, like, that's pretty much the best, like, yeah. you know, super villain, ex- you know, extravagant, waste of money that you could do also i assume the rest of your answer isn't going to be practical either (laughs) i mean you'd be surprised chris okay (laughs) prove me wrong so i wanted i want a practical elephant bearing boat so i found a fishing boat for sale it's a j and g forbes co tuna trawler only under a hundred thousand dollars which the fact that you can apparently buy like a tuna fishing boat for under under a hundred thousand dollars was a little surprising to me It is admittedly, like, 70 years old, but it's been refitted since it was built. But it's, like, 70 feet by 19 feet, which, using that formula, is, like, 16,000 pound capacity. Um, I'm also pretty sure that capacity formula breaks down at some point because they have a listed hold capacity of, like, 40,000 pounds on this thing. So, clearly, I think that's mostly just for, like, you know, personal use boats. But point being, I found a at least somewhat reasonably priced boat that you can put an elephant on, which was step one. So we have our fishing trawler going out in the seas. Why do we have an elephant? The question that I'm sure you want an answer to. (laughs) So the first reason, and this is why I went down this road in the first place, is I wanted to figure out if you could have an elephant do semaphore, (laughs) which is that thing that people do where they use flags to communicate. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So... But why? I they have these big I wanted to use the elephant ears somehow, but the only thing the ears actually like do that's cool, which is admittedly pretty cool, is the elephant cools themselves down with their ears. Just because like they have a bunch of blood vessels in them, they just pump the blood through the ears, and then the ears have like a lot of air on either side, so that if blood cools down and then goes into the rest of the body and cools them. But you can't do anything with that. 
But I just knew that ears are like a very important part of the elephant, you know, style. And I wanted to include them somehow. Elephant style. <laughs> elephant style. There's a lot of hand, literal hand waving that happened when I said elephant style. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the that's like the secret dojo moves is that is the elephant style hand wave. oh yeah <laughs> elephant style hand wave it's it's kind of like um i uh your your uh fountain style elephant fountain style distraction chris <laughs> 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 so i'm trying to figure out if you like painted an elephant's ears brightly colored could it do like the cm4 you know signals in terms of the way that works, you have, you know, a flag in each hand, and there's basically eight positions the flag can be in, and it's, like, 45 degree angle, so, like, straight up, straight down, straight left, straight right, and then, you know, 45 degrees between each of those, yeah. And then, by doing different, you know, you can do different letters or numbers or, you know, certain commands by doing them in different, you know, positions. Problem I ran into, obviously, is that an elephant cannot, for example, put one ear straight up and one ear to the right. That's not going to work. But there is a solution, which is just that it has both ears available and also holds a flag with its trunk, and then it can do everything. So you just abandoned the entire reason that you looked at this in the first place. Well, no, because you still, you still, it can only hold one flag with its trunk. Oh, uh, okay. It's still, so still using one ear at all times. Okay, got it. It's just that for a lot of them, you need more flexibility than you're going to get with just the ears. So, technically, you could have your elephant perform semaphore, semaphore. I actually know how you pronounce it. I try to figure out if the elephant could like, like see another ship's signaling. I don't think they can see far enough for that to really work. Uh, there's kind of mixed research on how good an elephant's vision is. But it looks like sort of the, the real fall point is about 50 meters, which is pretty close. Um, although that's kind of weird because also I saw um, something saying that like at that 50 meters, they were able to tell very small like body language cues from other elephants where they would like fold the lower part of their ear back if they were like trying to threaten an elephant. And they could like see that 50 meters out, which feels like they should be able to see further, but... Yeah, so based based on that, either their vision's really good or real shit. So <laughs> there's no way to know which one. I, it is. I did like one of the articles I was reading. Definitely implied that elephants just were like not lazy, but just didn't really bother seeing a lot of things. Like they had almost like selective vision. <laughs> And it was... I have lazy tunnel vision. Right. Well, and it was like they were talking about how, like, they also do have some things where I know elephants are generally better at seeing motion, like a lot of animals are. Um, but, like, they were saying that if they just walk straight towards an elephant, the elephant would always see them. But if they walk and, like, crouch down a little bit, anytime the elephant looked toward them, just stop moving, the elephant just wouldn't notice them. <laughs> Which... <laughs> just uninterested in not anything that not, not moving i guess yeah i guess one of the things where it's like for the most part you know they're just looking for predators right so it, it kind of makes sense that if something's not approaching them really not care that much but i don't know elephants i mean i guess i would say i feel the same way about like a cat on the street where if a cat's approaching me like oh shoot there's a cat right exactly but if i like if there's a cat around and he's just like chill and i'm like oh whatever yeah i don't know Point being, you might have to, like, look at the signal. You might have to, you know, do something for with your elephant. He you can't do it all on his own. But, I mean, at least you don't have to hold the flags. That's kind of cool. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> what else can your elephant do? So, probably the most useful thing your elephant can do is actually just straight up act as a lifeboat for you. So, as, as Mark has kind of brought up, elephants can swim. Elephants are actually way better swimmers than i thought they were you know i knew that elephants could swim i didn't realize how good they were at swimming apparently there are elephants in africa that have been recorded to travel like 48 kilometers across water which is about 30 miles whoa or swimming six hours continuously and there's actually some research from the university of melbourne that suggests that elephants may have actually evolved from aquatic mammals that like they're they they evolved from like sea cows and that their trunk was actually originally used as a snorkel because I always kind of wondered why elephants had, like, how an elephant evolved a trunk. It seems like a very weirdly specific, you know. It's like the only animal that has that. Right. But apparently it may have actually been used as a snorkel 
for a, a like swimming mammal, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's how elephants swim. Is they, they swim mostly submerged and poke their trunk up out as a snorkel. Um, apparently, they just like they actually just love swimming. They'll like go diving and stuff. I don't know. It's pretty cool. But point being, if your ship were to go down, you are very little weight to an elephant. You could definitely just hop on board and your elephant could swim you to shore. But if they're submerged, then you would be submerged. They're not entirely. They're not like. No, mostly submerged. Because yeah, they still have their trunk poking up. So they're like, you know. Crocodile submerged. Exactly. They're mostly. They're like an iceberg. But part of you would still be underwater. I mean, like your legs. Like your head would be. You'd, you'd be, be wet. You'd be wet. Yeah. Okay. It's not a boat. It's an elephant. But I mean. <laughs> it's also a friend, Chris. There's no, you know, no overseeing how important that is in times like that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with getting wet with a friend in an emergency. I'm just going to slide on past that one. So the last use of an <laughs> elephant at sea. <laughs> and this is one of the things that I, I was really hoping would work out. So a problem you run into on a boat is that water will frequently get into a boat. Not just because you like, you know, there's, you know, a crack in the side or something. But just from, you know, rain or waves sweeping over anything. And so boats will have to have bilge pumps that just pump out water to avoid it you know, building up and becoming an issue. So I was wondering if an elephant could actually act as your bilge pump on your boat. So the first question is, how, what is an elephant's pumping capacity? How did you research this? <laughs> I, I did. I figured it out. So an elephant can suck up around 14 liters or 3.7 gallons of water in their trunk at once. And I found a video on YouTube of a guy riding an elephant through the water while the elephant was, like, sucking up water and spraying it back on him. Which is very funny. It was, you know, very good video. It was a 33-second long video, and he sprayed the guy with water four times. So that would be eight and a quarter seconds per trunk full. But it was definitely lollygagging a little bit. And the fastest, like, trunk entry into water to, like, return to water was about five seconds. I'm going to say six seconds per trunk full, just, you know, to give a little bit of breathing room there. Um, which would be 10 trunkfuls per minute. So that 10 trunkfuls per minute is 37 gallons per minute, which is 22, sorry, 2,220 gallons per hour. So I looked up actual like bilge pump requirements slash recommendations. Uh, and annoyingly, most of the things I could find were just for, you know, more recreational boats uh, that were a lot smaller than our 70 foot uh, fishing boat. Um, but I did find a recommendation for a 40 to 45 foot boat of 2,000 to 4,000 gallons per hour of pumping. So it's probably not going to be able to do all of our, our pumping, but it can supply actually a pretty much larger chunk of it than I expected. Just from like comparing that to the recommendations for smaller boats, it seems like it scales up not linearly, but close enough for our purposes. So it could probably be about half of the pumping capacity which is a lot more than I expected when I try to figure out if an elephant could, you know, pump out water from your boat. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you actually see now that an elephant on a boat is pretty useful, much more than you would have expected to help you communicate. It's it's more than I would have expected, but it's also not enough to actually, res you know, let you not do any of the other things. Like, you still need to semaphore for your elephant to semaphore. You still probably want a lifeboat on your boat in case you're far enough out from shore. And you don't want to get wet. And you also still need the pump. You just don't have to run it quite as often. Probably the way it works is you probably have two pumps normally. And you only need one. So, I mean, it's kind of something. There's also a pretty big issue as well. <laughs> that is, which is that elephants eat a lot. And I don't think you can hold that much food on your boat. So, you probably shouldn't take an elephant on a boat. And the poop. You'd have a poop problem. You would have a poop problem. But if you did happen to have an elephant on a boat, it would be way more useful than I expected going into this answer. <laughs> And I guess that's my main takeaway, is that an elephant is a fine first mate. <laughs> <laughs> Not great, just fine. Yeah, eats a lot. Main problem. Ben, hmm. would you rather never be able to use a credit card again or pay for food only using pennies? Oh. All right, okay, so I'm going to... I'm gonna... Let's let's get like the smart ass out of the way first. I'm assuming you can't use just like like oh I use a debit card instead, right? Like that's no no. You have to like if you are buying any food, it has to be in pennies. No no. no I mean I mean for the credit card part. Oh yeah yeah no debit card no yeah. debit card. Oh god okay. 
I feel like this is a pretty easy one for me. So, can you can you buy? Oh, but I don't know how you would buy gift cards. You can't buy a gift card to the grocery store and use that. It would be oh, you're saying for online purchases? Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out like like the big problem I'm seeing is that how do you buy things online? And if you can't, that's a pretty big. Uh, yeah, I guess you can't. Yeah. Can you buy things on Amazon with like a cash or check? Can you, you like cannot. mail? <laughs> you cannot <laughs> mail. You cannot mail Jeff Bezos money, <laughs> and he'll just like ship it to you personally. That doesn't, that's not how Amazon works. So so like for almost for all like fees municipal stuff, there's always the you know pay by mail option. Yeah. Wait, are checks allowed in this case? Checks have to be allowed. If if checks aren't allowed, you you just can't like you can't you can't pay rent yeah. easily. I mean, you can. You can only pay rent in cash. cash. It just makes you look super super sketchy. Although you could buy Amazon, you could buy Amazon gift cards in cash. That you could. You, that's right. They sell those at like like grocery stores and stuff. So you could still buy things on Amazon. But that does that count? I would say gift cards don't count. I think gift cards you can use because it's still super super annoying. Because, like, like, think about it this way, Chris. So imagine you want to buy something on Amazon. Unless you happen to have a gift card already, which you could. You probably just keep some on hand. You have to go to the store in order to be able to go home and buy something on Amazon. Okay, yeah, I see that. Also, worse, even worse than that, let's say you have, you have your whole, you know, you load it up. You have your $100 Amazon gift cards in a stack by the computer. Have you ever tried to use a gift card to buy anything online? It's horrible. Yeah. You'll, you'll like go in and be like, oh, this thing's $42. Oh, but there's $38 left on this gift card. Oh, it won't let me put input two gift cards at the same time. Oh, nope, there goes my card. Oh, let me try again. I guess I've never tried to use two gift cards on one purchase before. What's the highest Amazon gift card you can get? Probably $100. That's not a lot. Yeah, probably. There might there might be 200 but 100 is probably the most you're going to get. Although I think actually Amazon gift cards don't work like... You know, Amex gift cards, they'll just like, I just add they'll your add money to your Amazon yeah. account so yeah. you can stack them without worrying about running out on one card. God, you are going to, so I'm noticing a problem with this plan though, is that you are going to get flagged as a like money launderer immediately. Like if you're just going to your grocery store and buying $500 in gift cards. Oh yeah. People are going to think you're getting scammed all the time. Oh no. They, they're not going to think you're getting scammed. They're going to think, think you money. either have like stolen money or counterfeit Counterfeit money money. one of the two oh yeah that too oh god these are both so bad we haven't talked about we haven't haven't talked talked about about purchasing food with pennies can it be can you use a roll of pennies i mean how much is in a roll of pennies is that just a dollar a roll of penny i think it's only a dollar yeah so like it's a dollar that's so bad yeah that's way too many pennies for all your food that's a lot Oh no, it's worse. It's only fifty cents. It's only, it's fifty cents for a roll of pennies. So that's like that'd be like two hundred fifty rolls of pennies if you're if you're going for like hundred twenty five bucks of food. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, we were just talking about the in- inconveniences of the Amazon gift cards, but I think this is way more inconvenient. I think it is too. I did not expect that, but I think it is too. Also, it also counts like restaurants right and non just like any you can go to food. you can you can inconvenience a grocery store cashier you're the asshole if you bring in rolls of pennies of course if you go to a restaurant and put like 50 bucks worth of pennies on the table you're i think they kick you out like even beyond that if you go to like chipotle and buy a burrito and put 12 rolls of pennies on the counter they're going they're just no even that is too much and you like all your trips to get food will have to be specifically to get food you're not going to just be like out during the day doing something else and then be like oh i'm hungry i'm going to get some food because you're not going to carry around those pennies all over the place also could you even go around comfortably get groceries with a backpack full of you know 250 rolls of court of pennies hold on what does a roll of pennies weigh oh my god stop <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an important important question apparently pennies minted after 1983 weigh two and a half grams so a roll of pennies is a little over a quarter pound apparently so like a hundred a hundred rolls of pennies would be 25 pounds yeah like 20 or like 27 and a half pounds like to use the actual full 
25 pounds is a lot to carry around. I mean, it's not... It also takes up a lot of space. Yeah, the space is a problem. Well, actually, not really. Like, they're pretty small. They're pretty dense, like, weight-wise. Um, if you have, like, a backpack. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, a heavy, a big, heavy suitcase for, like, multi, like the, the biggest, you know, a car- like a, you know, a biggest non-carry-on bag, suitcase. Yeah, it's 50 pounds. It's, it's 50 pounds. And that's, like... I mean, even if you don't mind carrying around this stuff, I think the social aspect of it is, like, bad enough. Like, everyone's going to hate you. Yeah, for me, I mean, for me, what got me is the restaurants. Yeah, restaurants are bad. I mean, I think grocery stores are just as bad as restaurants. They they actually probably are. He's right. Just from the scale of it. Maybe even worse, because there's a line behind you. Like, to me, to me, the restaurant's more personal. Like, it's more of a, uh, like... Because you've already sit through a meal, and they've already served you, and <laughs> been and nice to and you. And you're not giving these, like, you're not giving these pennies to, you know... The powers that be at, you know, Stop and Shop. Like, it's not some faceless well, corporation a chain collect, you know, dealing with your 250 pennies. Like, it's it's the dude that runs his, like, you know, little fo- local family restaurant. I mean, there are family grocery stores, too. I'm imagining, I'm imagining Tiffy and just leaving, like, eight rolls of pennies on your check. Yeah. <laughs> just, like, the subtle, like, I'm imagining, like, the scene where, like, you know, like, Grandma slips you, like, you know, 20 bucks secretly in, like, your shirt pocket. <laughs> Except, like... You're doing that to like the way <laughs> the waiter, and you're doing it with like fifty rolls of pennies, just like a little something for your troubles. Ka-shoom. Right. <laughs> so it sounds like we're leaning pretty heavily towards. I think uh, it's no credit cards. No credit is card. there any? Is there any advantage to the penny thing? I mean, you get to use your credit card. Like other besides food, you can yeah do everything else. But I think like the majority of stuff you, or at least I buy, is food. Yeah, comes up a lot. Yeah. I don't see a way that you can redeem the the hundred pennies right now. So, with that, I think we're ready to do our final determination. Um, I'm gonna unsurprisingly vote for. I would rather not be able to use a credit card. Same. Same. <laughs> I don't think we really need nope. to say that. Yeah. <laughs> easy peasy. You know what else is easy peasy, guys? Giving us money. Yeah. If you go to www.patreon.com/slash/absurdhypotheticals and click on the become a patron button. It's just a dollar a month, 100 pennies, which may sound like a lot of pennies, but it's not. It's just two rolls of them. And you can use your credit card. Um, and you, yeah, you could use your convenient credit card unless you are stuck in this hypothetical situation and Actually, our podcast I don't, counts as mine food. I don't know if you can pay us in pennies because we don't really offer that as an option. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't send us those pennies. <laughs> but anyway, just a dollar. And you get access to our behind-the-scenes episodes where we do all sorts of awesome little things. Uh, We talk about how we make the show. We go over the previous month's questions, what we really felt about each other's answers, you know, mistakes that we made. Um, We've we've had guests on. We've done trial runs for content. Like, we did a trial run for our 100th episode there. We've done Ben drank spicy milk this one time. It's just all the things were like, hey, this would be really fun. We put it behind our tiny, tiny like paywall not even a paywall it's like it's like a couple pay bricks it's like a pay fence at most yeah like a like a dollhouse picket fence paywall um that you can just easily hop over by accidentally dropping a dollar but go do that or don't i mean i can't force you yet we need more <laughs> yeah. new laws about podcasts and uh i have my my high-powered lobbyists paid by the penny to, you know, take it to Washington and, and get some new legislation where I can force people to subscribe to our podcast. But that while that goes through, you can just continue listening, you know, using your free will next week when we answer the following question. What if your brain was connected to the internet? 